because I'm guessing that philosophy is not traditional text time in uh, architecture school. How, how did you know this? <laughs> now he gets a philosopher. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I have a degree in philosophy. And so, and I knew about Deleuze before Deleuze was interesting to me as an architect. Mm -hmm. um, why Deleuze is interesting to an architect is, with the exception, ironically, of Lepli, he's a very spatial philosopher, like Husserl or someone. I mean, he, he really thinks in terms of spatial relation and spatial typology. So. Architects connect with Deleuze more deeply than other philosophers. Same thing with Leibniz. He's a very spatial philosopher. Um, most, the test, whatever, for most philosophers of that type, the kind of great philosophers, is that you have to have a position on geometry before you're allowed to have a position on linguistics. And so architects can go to any of those philosophers and get their early work on geometry and think through architecture with it. So you'd be surprised how much architecture looks to philosophy. Um, but Deleuze especially because he's so spatial. And you know, Deleuze and Leibniz in particular for that reason. But it's also, uh, with Leibniz and Deleuze is also the process uh, mm -hmm. which really attracts you in this. Because in some way, architecture was thought as something which was done and then finished, so to speak. But in fact, it's not. It's just a momentary moment, the finishing of it. And then it has to prove it has been architecture and not just garbage. No? So that is what uh, then the life begins and gets different perspectives. I could think that this part would also be attractive for uh, a new kind of architecture. Mm -hmm. It's not that they are the Platonist here. That's probably a problem. Yeah, okay. Um, I also love the designs of the objects and then the lamps and then the big buildings. I was wondering, like Wolfgang, about the difference between the livability. You, you talked about moving away from the numerical concept of the head's relation to the body. And I, I don't want to get stuck in the, the human body and the object division, but I didn't do very well in that. Is there a calculus of the human body? that relates this external environment calculus to some form of usability or? Uh, well, it's, it's funny, it all, I mean, I'm not gonna say you guys are all philosophers. When you talk to the philosophers, they always talk about the, ha the house and they would privilege the person's experience of the space. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but so, you know, the interior of the church, let's say. You know, how did you feel when you saw the interior of the church? I mean, it, it looks like a church. Yeah, it fitted for the purpose, yeah. yeah. It focuses you to the altar. I mean, it should it, be a dance hall, actually. As God is dead, but they haven't heard it in Korea yet. <laughs> no, it's a Korean Presbyterian God, which is what, you know. I was looking at one of the walls, and it, it, may, it may not have been actually what was intended Surface, and I'm just trying to imagine myself meeting up against that wall. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I mean, honestly, the you know, all of the stuff I showed is you know, very ergonomic, although it doesn't look familiar. Okay, so that's you know, so you take uh, the person in. The personal ex experience into your account because the reason my philosophers talk about the house because that's how they experience architecture, no? living someplace. No? No, but Kennedy or somebody is a more is a better model of experience. I mean, the experience of the crowd or the group is more my concern than the experience of the person alone in the space thinking about the space. A group? There's a group? I've never met one. Okay, but you never met a group. <laughs> I only see intruders in my monad here, that's all. <laughs> Who are you guys? No, but like this room would only work if you thought of a collection of 30 or 40 people. It would be not a workable room if you thought of them sitting in here by yourself. Yes, I'm sitting by myself, but some people <laughs> uh, penetrated my monad. Some of them I don't see, I'm there already out, and the others I have already transcended long, long before. Okay, but I said what you mean. Um, 
Oh, yes. So, but like, here's a, just real quick, yeah. like, there's a chair, you know? Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a strange-looking chair. It's a comfortable chair. It actually wasn't so much the looking. I was wondering if when you're saying it's ergonomic, I understand. And what I'm asking is if the conceptual calculus, does calculus apply to the body? Or, I don't understand. Well, um, calculus in this chair works that typically you would have a seat, a back, legs, and armrests. You'd have five or six different variables. Most designs of chairs articulate those things as individual components. You know, this puts all four or five of those things into two surfaces. So there's a surface that is doing the work of the back, the seat, and the arm all at the same time. But so that's all calculus is, is it's just putting variables into continuity. It's not really, it doesn't have a privileged shape, or it doesn't have a you know, it's not like the modular or the ideal Vitruvian man or something like that. There's no, you can't think calculus in that way of ideal forms and shapes. You really just think putting different variables together into some kind of continuity.